the object of our greatest affections. This is idolatry. This is abomination. Let's talk now about some historic errors concerning sin. Gnosticism cannot be ignored as a a historical movement and historical influence upon the modern Calvinist Augustinian conception of what a sin is. When I'm talking about Augustinianism, I'm talking about the Roman Catholic conception of sin. I'm talking when I'm talking about Calvinism, I'm talking about the prevailing conception, the definitions of sin that we have in mainline evangelical Christianity today. But back around the second, third, fourth century AD, a a, a pseudo mystical, pseudo righteous cult began to develop very largely among intellectuals and thinkers in the ancient world, in ancient Asia Minor, in, in Mediterranean countries called Gnosticism. And if we begin to study Gnosticism historically, we find that uh, authorities such as the Encyclopedia Britannica, even the Jewish encyclopedias and others, are, are quick to admit that Gnosticism was invented by Jews. And these Jews were inheritors of exactly the same Kabbalistic or Kabbalah tradition that came out of Babylon even in the century or two before Jesus Christ. Alfred Edersheim, uh, who is uh, perhaps the very greatest Jewish and also a Christian uh, expert on the history of the Jews, uh, is very candid again in, in saying that Gnosticism and esoteric traditions, I should say, Kabbalistic traditions originated in the centuries before Jesus, that early, coming from the uh, the occult center of antiquity, Babylon, and so uh, in in the first and second century after Christ, as we know from the Book of Acts, there was a very definite and concerted effort by the Pharisees originating in Jerusalem, the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, to destroy Christianity, and so it is no accident that that the church, the ancient church fathers are united in pointing a finger at the Jews as the originators of virtually all of the great heresies of the early church period. And one of these heresies was Gnosticism. Now, Gnosticism was particularly insidious because Gnosticism veiled itself in piety, in a pseudo-piety, and a putting down of the flesh. Like all all pagan doctrines, it was divided between a philosophical half and a, uh, and a half which appealed to the masses, which had all kinds of deities and gods and so on. You see this in Hinduism, Buddhism, all of these, these cults of, of uh, the pagan world. That there's a philosophical half which appeals to to the high-minded, the uh, ascetic and the spiritual and theologically inclined. And then there's also a, a form of Buddhism and Hinduism with millions of gods in, in which the people can participate with their altars and their offerings and lots of, lots of images and uh, uh, visuals that can keep them uh, ostensibly satisfied by these religions. And that's the way it was with Gnosticism. We'll, we'll just concern ourselves for a few minutes with with the philosophical and theological division of Gnosticism. Gnosticism said, and it seemed to glorify God, it, it's, it, Gnosticism said that God, the ultimate form of gnosis or knowledge or self, enlightened self-awareness is so far above this terrestrial defiled, lowly world that we can't even say anything about him. He is absolutely, ineffably holy and far above. He's beyond He's beyond in, uh, intelligence even. He's beyond morality. He's beyond base emotions of right and wrong and judgment and all these kinds of things. He is absolutely 
out of all possibilities for our comprehension. Now that sounds that sounds very very exalted. Uh, you're exalting God to the ultimate degree. Actually, you're exalting God out of existence. But this had an appeal to the ascetic or the uh, the high-minded spiritual people, even in the church of the of the ancient world in the several centuries after Christ. It seemed to exalt God and it seemed to put down the flesh, which was also very appealing to the ancient theologians of the church. People like Origen and others who are leaders of the church were attracted to this idea of putting down the flesh and exalting an ultimate God. Okay, That was a wicked combination, literally, and it had tremendous appeal to certain aspects within the leadership of the early church. Now, Gnosticism said that this whole world, human, all, of, all of this fleshly world, including fleshly humanity, is intrinsically evil, not because of the moral decisions we make for right or wrong, for God or away from God. No, we are evil because we exist in a human body. And our flesh is evil. Our flesh is intrinsically evil as long as we are on this world, in this world, and, and alive, we will be torn between all kinds of passionate feelings and lusts and desires and attachments, and we are hopelessly kept in an imperfect and evil state just because we exist. Okay? Now, this had a tremendous effect upon the early church because there are Verses in Paul and verses in Scripture which tell us to mortify the deeds of the flesh and to bring under subjection our body and so on. And these Gnostic teachers in and out of the church picked up on what Paul said and picked up uh, on, on the certain of this mortifying of the flesh image or emphasis in Scripture. And as a result of Gnostic influence, in the 2nd and 3rd and 4th century, we find a literally horde of young men and even young women leaving the church, leaving the public life, leaving the marketplaces of the ancient world where souls needed to be witnessed to and redeemed from their sin. And they went out into the deserts of Egypt and Syria and Palestine and Greece, wherever, they went out and they lived in caves, they lived in monasteries, they created monasteries, and out there they began to purge and try to get rid of this evil flesh that was dragging them downward and, and attempting to ascend to <coughs> contemplation of God and rise up higher and higher to a full uh, experience of the greatness and exaltation of God. This is called asceticism. And asceticism took root in the in these centuries, leading, of course, to the monasteries, the monastic system of the Roman Catholic Church, of the celibacy of, of the nuns and the priests and so on, with this idea that sex is evil and uh, those who uh, separate themselves from the world in a monastic or ascetic way are going to have a better chance of attaining holiness and purity. In other words, they'll have a much better chance of escaping purgatory, which may be thousands of years of trials in the next life before you can even go to heaven as this wicked flesh is being purged away from us. This was a very great, great error. Now, this idea that the flesh is evil and that we, even as Christians, are bound and chained to the dictates of our evil flesh, and we cannot really escape this evil flesh as long as we live in this world, is a fundamental instinct still of Roman Catholicism and of modern Calvinism. You talk to any Calvinist and you say, no, no, we're not in, in chains to our evil flesh, but we can make a clear decision for Jesus Christ to put down the flesh, exalt him, and make him absolute Lord of our lives and come into a state of complete loyalty with you, with him. And say, oh, they'll say, oh, no, no, we can't do that. Uh, 
Paul says, O wretched man, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Uh, that which I don't want to do, that which I, uh, I do, and that which I want to do, I don't do. I'm caught in this wretchedness of sin as long as I live. And only with death, only at death will I be freed from the bondage to, uh, to the necessity, almost the necessity, certainly the inevitability of sinning in this life. Okay? So there has been a tremendous degree of confusion about what, what sin is or the, or the moral nature of our own human bodies as a result of perverse Jewish-inspired attempts to destroy Christianity starting in the earliest centuries of the church. Now, let's, uh, let's consider a, a verse uh, that bears upon this by, by our Lord himself. Turn over to Matthew 5.27. This, this passage seems to give aid and comfort to this idea that we are inescapably evil just by being human. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Wow. Boy, doesn't that just go like a spear point into the heart of every red-blooded 16-year-old boy who, who says, My heavens, O oh Lord, have mercy on me. I, I have looked. I have looked at... at Girls, I have looked and I have thought sexual thoughts. They came unbidden, but I, they came to me. And alas, I have committed adultery. It's as good as I, I'm, I'm a sinner. It's as good as I've committed adultery. And this verse is brought forward by these very Calvinists and Augustinians we're talking about here tonight. You say, just being human, just sitting at an intersection and watching a pretty girl go across the street is as much as committing adultery for any man. And because of verses like this, they, the priests take a vow of celibacy to go into a convent and not, not associate with women because lest they should look upon their silhouette and profile and a lustful thought come into their mind and they, by definition, commit the act of adultery just by looking at that woman. Is that what Jesus is talking about here? Is that what he's teaching? Let, let's just put a little bit of blame on Jesus for just, just in, in jest here. Jesus is the one who designed the fuselage of women. The, those proportions. <laughs> I mean, he did it. He did it for a reason. He did it to, to cur excite males in order to breed to, to perpetuate the species in order, in order to put it bluntly, to create little babies that they could grow up and become Christians and accept him and trust him. That's why he created the allure of the human body. So it's not all our, far, all our fault, guys, that we, we are attracted to what Jesus made. Now, is Jesus so perverse and twisted that having created not only the proportions of the female but he also indicts us for appreciation of that or he indicts us for having a brain structure, a male brain structure and chemical hormones and so on that, that, that operate and pulsate in accordance with what he has, he has masterminded in order to create the perpetuation of, of, of the human race. Of course he's not. Jesus is not that twisted, not that perverse. I mean, he, he's not wanting to judge us and condemn us coming and going, which is what would happen if, if he were really angry when, when, we, when a male exp experiences some pleasure at looking at female. 
The crucial word in this passage is lust. And the word is epithumia, which means covet. Epithumia means covet. And tragically, tragically this this crucial verse continues to be mistranslated to give the wrong impression what Jesus, of what Jesus is saying. Let's read that again. Matthew 5, 27. And I'll, and I'll, correct, I'll, I'll translate it correctly. 